It's time for Wise Money with Corhorn Financial Group with certified financial planners Kevin Corhorn, Mike Bernard, and Josh Gregory. Welcome to another episode of the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group, where every week we're helping you take your next wise step in your financial life. Thanks for being here, friends. My name is Mike Bernard. I'm your host. I'm also one of the certified financial planners on the program. And with me in the KFT studios, as always, my business partners and fellow CFPs, Kevin Corhorn and Josh Gregory. More than any time on record, retirees are returning to work in droves. What's causing this? Or maybe more importantly, how does going back to work impact your financial plan? We'll help you unpack the opportunities and the consequences on this episode of Wise Money. That's right. This is a trend. However, we get this question a lot. We've gotten it a lot in the past year, but certainly throughout our career. So how does it impact you financially? We're going to help you navigate that. If you have a question for the show, we'd love to hear from you. If you have any questions about your own financial situation or or, or kind of need to start the planning process, we're here to help. Call or text us 574-222-2000. That's 574 574- 222-2000, online, wisemoneyshow.com, and then all over social media, wherever you're at, we are there as well. All right, so here's the deal. About, uh, I don't know, a month ago, article came out, and what, figures lie and liars figure. However, mm-hmm. this one meets sort of uh, my um, experiential, empirical kind of test here. Um, roughly, get this, 1.5 million people have were retired, and they unretired in the past year, went back to work. They previously had said, we're retired, 1.5 million people. That's 3% of all retired people out there said, eh, I'm going back to work in the past three months. Now, I, this it's big, big, big financial opportunities that you need to be aware of. So what 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 doors does this open? And what do you need to be aware of? What landmines do you need to you know tiptoe around? But first, guys, just curious your opinion. Like, why? Why do you, why do you think this trend is occurring. Well, before we say why, can we say thank you? Uh, (laughs) My goodness, can you imagine how rough it would be hiring folks if if this 1.5 million people weren't back in the workforce? I mean, there is just a shortage of of workers in almost every single industry. So is that what you think it is? The labor market got too hot where it's just too enticing? Wait a second. I left my job when I was when I was doing, you know, making this much and I could return to work making even more or I, I hear uh, there's a bakery on, on the on the radio station I tend to listen to. There's a bakery that talks about hourly wages at a bakery. Uh-huh. It's mind blowing how much they're paying for. So, and I'm assuming like this shift is from 2 a.m. until 8 a.m. Right. Uh-huh. So no one really wants to to work it. But yeah, uh, I, I I had a job one time at a bakery, but they let me go because I I couldn't make enough dough. Yeah, I, uh-huh. I bet you couldn't. Yeah, maybe sampled a little yeah, bit too. Right, right, <laughs> but so anyway, I is, is actually it, ate all the profits. You, you think you think this? You think it's a sign more that the labor market's gotten too hot? What about has the market has the stock market gotten too cold? People thought they could retire and saw their stock market, uh, your, their investment account drop 20 percent and say, "I, I got to return to work." Yeah, you do have to wonder, like how how many people chose to retire because of just the risks that. Uh, they were facing. Maybe they were on the front lines during the COVID pandemic, and it, it was still so uncertain early on how this disease was going to play out and what the the ramifications would be to someone's personal health. And there, there are a lot of people that said, you know what, I'm I'm making a a risk uh, reduction type decision, and I'm stepping into retirement. Or maybe it, it could have been burnout. Yeah. You know, just working crazy hours because there there was a shortage then of you know, great doctors and nurses and, and so on. So there may be some people that were almost pushed into retirement because of the pandemic over the past couple of years. And you, you do wonder, well, how many of them either regret um, ending so abruptly? Maybe they didn't really feel like they were ending on their own terms or based on their own plan and, and they wanted to go back. I, I don't know how many people are really doing it um, just out of a sense of, you know, a, a American obligation to go help help out i i doubt that that would be a a part of it yeah but you do wonder the market being down does that shake some people's confidence i'm assuming that attributed to it more than oh the the job market is so enticing i'm going to enter back in that's that's my guess either market being down or just life getting so expensive 
Absolutely. inflation being you know such a, a major player. That was the joke with Tom Brady when he announced his unretirement. You know, he's in After this like one point five months. Uh, <laughs> they they thought well, this is a sign of inflation when you know it's so expensive. <laughs> Tom's like, I got to go back to work. <laughs> Giselle, I, I got to go back to work and make I, some more money. It, it, think about the guy that that bought that last football that he used. <laughs> yeah, right. Or I don't know the last football last jersey, whatever. But yeah, yeah. was it yeah. deflated? Is that where you going there? <laughs> oh, so, all right, here we go. <laughs> here we go. Whether, regardless of the reason, it doesn't really matter to us. I mean, work that out with your certified financial planner. Make a wise choice to enter retirement. Hope most people want to just do it once, but if you have re-entered the workforce, or maybe might, you know, possibly in, in your life, what are the financial? What's the financial impact? Let's start with Social Security, guys. If you retired and you were like the majority and said, all right, Social Security starts immediately, Mm -hmm. returning to work can have an impact on your Social Security payment. Uh, Especially if you're... Um, if you retired before full retirement age, yeah. according to Social Security. So m- maybe you're 62 years old and uh, you-, you decided you were going to step out of the workforce and you are old enough, you're-, you're allowed to start Social Security at age 62. And if you do, that's fine. You're going to start collecting a reduced dollar amount because there's penalties for-, for starting early. But also when you go back to work, now there's a threshold on how much you can earn without having any implications on that Social Security check. In other words, you're allowed to, to earn wages of up to $19,600 per year without them messing with your Social Security. Mm-hmm. If you go over 19600 that's fine. You're earning more money. That's great. But for every $2 that you earn above that threshold that I shared, there's going to be a dollars reduction in your Social Security benefit. And so some people, as they're going back to work, they're paying attention to this dollar amount and it's causing them to not maybe go back to the career that they left. Maybe it's just a part-time role or a a brand new job that's as much fun as it is a a paycheck. But uh, just pay attention to this. And uh, it, it's not the end of the world if you do have a reduction in your in your benefits. That's money that you know c- kind of stays in the kitty, and eventually, you know, you'll you'll have maybe a higher payout down the road. Yeah, I I th- I would encourage folks if they say, "Hey, I want to go to work to get the goodness that I that I had at work." And I've known a lot of folks that have that have done something different. I, there's lots of retired folks, especially in our area, that have said, "I'm gonna my second career. I'm gonna be a driver." And I know mm-hmm. some of these retired guys. Uh, in theory, they're retired, but they'll they'll drive buses from yeah. out of Goshen down to Florida, Atlanta, things like that. And you know they deliver RVs yeah. or something. And they yep. figure out, all right, well, how can we? Um, you know, share a rental car. We can do they. I mean, really, how to maximize the situation, and they just have fun with it. Yeah. So there it, are some fun things you can do. There are some options you're going to want to look into this. If you say, "Well, wait a second, I I am going to make more than that limit that Josh said, and I don't really like having my Social Security penalized." I believe there is. Well, there are options where you could pay back all of your Social Security and basically make it like it never even happened. That's a topic for a different show. You could even pause your Social Security. We're, that's the topic for a different show as well. Work with your CFP on that. But the other point that we'd make about Social Security and going back to work, if you're past your full retirement age, no problem. Make no all you want. Go yep. out and make as much money as you want. Now we're going to talk about taxation. Your Social Security likely will be more taxable if it if it wasn't being taxed before. It would be. Uh, because you're making more money and you're above that threshold. Again, we'll get to that, but it wouldn't be penalized. Oftentimes, you know, well, I view taxes as a penalty <laughs> personally, but oftentimes <laughs> that, you're is, an American. that is confused. People get confused between, well, is my Social Security taxed or is it penalized? And it's, those are two different things. If you're drawing Social Security and working past your full retirement age, no penalty. Before your full retirement age, there could be. What other ways could returning to work after retiring could it impact your financial life we've got that more coming up on the wise money show with corhorn financial group hello youtube thanks for being here this is the wise money show you're at the wise money show channel make sure you hit that subscribe button turn on notifications and if you like the content like the content what you're watching right now is our weekly one hour talk show that airs right here on this channel every saturday morning 10 a.m eastern time also on podcasts at the same time but also on a couple local 
radio stations where we have our headquarters. And that's why the content's this long and structured, kind of broken up the way that it is. Uh, there's a lot of other content, though, on this channel. The chances are, if you've thought about a financial concept, financial question, we've created some some videos about it to help you get the right perspective or approach it the right way, give you some nuggets along the way. So uh, make sure you hit that subscribe button, turn on notifications, and if you like the content, like the content. Thank you very much. And leave comments as well, questions. Appreciate it. All right, anything else with Social Security? or Do, do we, we need to just say that if your Social Security, if you are penalized and it's reduced, that it, that's temporary? It's not a it's not a permanent thing. I yeah, don't, I don't know that. If, if that's necessary or not. But Let's start with that and then get into Medicare. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to clean that up a little bit, then you might also point out that in the year that someone – um, reaches full retirement age, they're allowed to earn even more before any of those reductions apply. Yep. Okay, so here, if you're if you're under full retirement age and want to stop Social Security benefits, you must do so within 12 months and file a request for withdrawal of application, repay all benefits received by you and by anyone, such as a spouse receiving a benefit on your record, and repay Medicare premiums if they were deducted from your checks. Yep. So, I mean, it's a really simple, easy process. <laughs> <laughs> Not expensive either. No. I've had two clients do it. Yeah. And um, I think in one of the situations, it was we were working a certain Social Security strategy before they closed the loophole. And they signed up, and they were very thorough. This is the strategy we're working, and the Social Security agent set them up with the wrong one. Oh. And by the time we had our next meeting, we had talked a little bit as well. But by the time we had the next meeting, it was like, no, this isn't right. Uh -huh. Give them a call and work through this. And they called and then called me. And is that right? And it's like, no, it's not. You, you got to unwind this thing. Mm. Or I said, well, you could leave it the way it is or you can unwind it. And they said, no, we're going to unwind it. Mm. But you can only do that in the first 12 months, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So and then you can pause your your Social Security, but there are. You give up some benefits with that. So, yeah. Anyway. All right. <clears throat> There's a trend going on where folks that the boom of folks that have retired over the past couple of years, they're returning to work, unretiring. 1.5 million people. If that's you. How does it impact your financial life? What decisions do you need to be aware of? We're helping with that right now. This is the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Thanks for being here. My name's Mike Bernard. With me in the KFT studios, Kevin Corhorn and Josh Gregory. Uh, stay up to date on all Wise Money content. Find us online, wisemoneyshow.com, and then all over social media, wherever you're at. We are there as well. Search the Wise Money Show. All right, first thing that is impacted, if you retired and immediately turned on Social Security, returning to work likely will impact your Social Security. It certainly would if you are younger than full retirement age you're going to want to be aware of the income limit the earnings limit that that how much you can make where your social security wouldn't be penalized if you make more than what'd you say josh i think it's nineteen thousand six hundred per yeah, year yeah so um then if you make more than that and you're not yet at your full retirement age your social security could be penalized a couple things to just honorable mention with that before we move on um, first, those are wage wages, right? Okay. If you've got pension income, you've got IRA withdrawals, you've got interest, dividends, capital gains, that sort of stuff. That doesn't it doesn't weigh in. Now it weighs into how much of your Social Security is taxable, but that, like we said, that's a different issue. Mm -hmm. it, that won't, in and of itself, create uh, cause your Social Security to be penalized. What what else do we need to make sure we hit about Social Security? Well, I, you know, you, you mentioned the $19,600 per year earnings threshold before this penalty applies. Just keep in mind that in the year that you reach full retirement age for you, it's unique based on the year that you were born, you're actually allowed to earn quite a bit more than that. It's 51000 960. So just a, a lot more money that you're allowed to earn without them uh, penalizing you any on, on going over the, the earnings threshold. I think this is going to apply to most folks um, because if you're, if you're considering going back to work, it likely means you're on the younger age of retirement. And most people, when they retire, draw Social Security immediately. So the, the discussion here was simply to point out, work with your certified financial planner and make sure that CFP is doing comprehensive financial planning so they, so they can help you optimize for Social Security. 
know how this impacts your tax situation, help you do some tax planning, um, and really know how this decision with Social Security, returning back to work, blah, 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 how that impacts all six areas of your financial life. The other kind of social system that oftentimes is associated with retirement is Medicare. Now, you can't just turn on Medicare immediately. There's an age limit. You got to be 65, okay, mm-hmm. uh, it, for, for, for Medicare. Um, unretiring, if you've signed up for Medicare already, uh, what's, what's the impact? You basically stay on it, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah you, can, you can take your employer's benefit, health benefit, and stay on Medicare. Um, one was going to be considered primary coverage, the other is secondary. And then um, if you remain on any part of Medicare, you can't participate in an HSA if your employer right. offers one. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so think about that. Um, you retired the first time you went on Medicare part A and part B, and you maybe got a, a Medicare supplement policy above and beyond that. If you go back to work then, and that employer offers a group health insurance plan that you can join in on, then you would still have part A and part B, but maybe that group health insurance actually replaces the Medicare supplement for as long as you're continuing to work again. Some employers will also give you um, maybe a financial stipend or, or some sort of an incentive to not join their group plan as well. Uh, you know, uh, so, some employers might pay a, a couple hundred dollars or a few hundred dollars a month if you don't go on their group plan. And so that's something to keep in mind as well, something to be asking about as you're, you're joining back into a new firm. I, so, and I don't have the details right in, right in front of me. And we have health insurance experts on the Corhorn Financial Group team. We had Craig Weicker, Ben Bolgreen on the show a few weeks ago. So I didn't get a chance to ask them this specifically prior to the show, but I would just point out, I, be, I my understanding is if you are on Medicare and sign up for a supplement, when you do so, as long as you do so within a certain period of time, then you're, there's guaranteed insurability. There's no um, you know, uh, a pre-existing conditions that you need to worry about with your supplement. But then if you get off your supplement because you've returned to work and now your employer is providing health insurance at a, at a, a low cost to you until so you drop your supplement, then when you get back on your supplement, I think you actually have to prove insurability at that point. And that might be way more expensive, quote unquote, than, um, than, you know, giving up that, supplement to begin with. So the point here is there might be an issue. I believe, I believe there is. Work with your CFP and make sure they're working with a health insurance expert. Now, if you're not on Medicare, say you say you retired in um, you know in the past couple of years and you weren't yet 65. So you didn't get on Medicare, but you returned to work. Now what's the impact? How does returning to work, how could it impact your health insurance maybe that you got through Cobra or healthcare.gov. Well, again, I mean, if if you have the opportunity to leave that uh, private insurance that you put in place in the marketplace um, and, and go back on a group plan, that might be to your advantage. Oh, I right? would I would expect so. Uh, especially if your employer is helping to subsidize a lot of that cost and and so on. Co- Cobra, by its very nature, would likely be less expensive, right? Cobra. Uh, this is just the continuation of the coverage you had for up to 18 months. Um, you're going to pay that entire cost mm-hmm. when you're on COBRA. Mm-hmm. Most employers don't offer some sort of cost sharing. Now, during the pandemic, there was um, a stimulus put in place where it was totally covered um, by the government, actually. But in most cases, you're going to have to pay 100% of that cost. But when you're an employee and the your employer offers health insurance, typically they're going to cover part of it, 50%, maybe something like that. And so it's if you're on COBRA, going back to work, if you're eligible for health insurance benefits, it's likely going to be to your advantage to take that plan. If you instead, though, didn't have COBRA, or maybe you're past COBRA, and you're on health insurance through healthcare.gov, then it's a tax decision. And, and mm-hmm. that's, that's the segue here. When you signed up for healthcare.gov, you input, hey, here's how much I think my overall income is going to be for the year. And that influenced how much you're going to pay for your health insurance that you purchased through healthcare.gov. And um, you could have been paying a reduced monthly premium amount, 
And actually, this is so confusing. I haven't mastered how to communicate this. The reason you're paying a reduced monthly amount is because you're getting tax credits in advance, okay? Based on, well, my income's only gonna be this. Well, when you go back to work, that likely means your income is going to be higher. And so you might think, and this is the key point, folks, you might think, okay, well, all of a sudden I found out my income is going to be higher. So I will drop my health insurance through healthcare.gov and I'll pick up the employer sponsored plan and I'll be fine. No, that's not how it works. Even while, even while you're, you were on that insurance for healthcare.gov, You weren't saying, well, this is just what my income is during this pocket of the year. It's this is what my income is going to be for the whole year. Right. If you wind up for that entire year having income above those levels, even if if it was just a few months that you held had insurance through healthcare.gov, you're going to have to pay those premium tax credits back. Does that make sense? That did I? Yeah, I I think so. And a, a variation of that story is maybe you don't go back to work for another employer. What if you started your own side business or something? Yeah. You know, become self employed. Now, again, same same issue. Maybe your income starts getting high enough that you lose some of the benefits that you thought you were going to have earlier in the year. But pay attention to the fact that uh, health insurance premiums for a self-employed individual have different uh, tax ramifications than for an employee of a business. That's right. So this is when when, when they launched healthcare, healthcare.gov, the Affordable Care Act, that brought a health insurance decision connected. It made it connected to your other parts of your financial life, specifically your taxes, meaning your CFP needs to be involved in working with your health insurance agent and advisor to help you navigate this landscape. What else is impacted when you unretire, return to work? We've got that more coming up on the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Third segment. Third segment. So the you know, it's interesting as you look, there's there's a there's actually a site called unretire.com. Hmm. Um or actually it's called the unretiring.com. And they they've got some pretty awesome resources. I, do you ever, sounds ominous, actually. Like, <laughs> yeah, sounds like a bad right. movie. <laughs> so they they and they the they shame. give these reasons why you would do it. You're having trouble making ends meet. You've become too sedentary. You can't adjust to your new life. You've lost social connections. I mean, that's not possible because um, I think of certain retired people that I know, like. They have these faux social connections uh, on Facebook all day long. Um, <laughs> you love being in the workplace. You're ready to start over in the workplace. Um, you have a great idea for a new business, or it's time to pursue your passion. Hmm. So I mean, cool. It is. It the is list. interesting, and I don't know if we if we say this, but I mean, if you ask me, what's the financial plan that has a hundred percent certainty of success? Don't retire. Don't retire. Yeah, I mean, we talked. We were doing a, a presentation yesterday for a, a group um, that we have the retirement plan for, and um, Josh Fritzky said, "What is so? What does retirement look like for you?" And one of the guys said, "Work." Hmm. So I'm like, "All right, well, yeah, that guy's retirement will work." But this is <laughs> this is the thing. You know, you have these fire people who are like, "Okay." Financial independence, retire early. And then they'll put themselves on YouTube, right? So I retired at 32, and now I'm doing this. Now I have a job. Yeah, and I'm like, okay, dude. That, <laughs> a so YouTube you, job? You, you did not retire because um, you, you, you're doing something. Right. Um, you, re, you might have changed occupations. Yeah. But <clears throat> anyway. All right, third segment. Over 1.5 million people that have retired have returned to the workforce in the past 12 months. This is a new trend. How does it impact your financial life? We're helping with that right now. This is the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Thanks for being here. My name is Mike Bernard. With me in the KFG studios, Kevin Corhorn and Josh Gregory. Every episode of the Wise Money Shows on the YouTube channel. Go check it out wherever you listen to YouTube or, yeah, I guess on your phone or wherever. Uh, go to YouTube, search the Wise Money Show and uh, subscribe to it there and then also turn on notifications because not only is this show available each and every week but all sorts of additional content we publish content there monday through friday so actually so monday through saturday and make sure uh you're made aware every time we drop new content go to youtube search the wise money show all right so unretiring what's the financial impact now there's 
Social Security and Medicare, health insurance. Those are the biggies. But there's a lot of other ways that unretiring will impact your finances, and some of them bring on more opportunities than consequences. Let's talk next about tax planning. How does unretiring impact your tax situation? Well, I mean, obviously it's going to have an impact on the, the income that you show for that year. Um, you know, you're going to stack now some wages on top of whatever other income you had already started. Maybe you started your pension, maybe you started Social Security, and you're going to throw additional uh, income on top of that. And so it could start to cause some of your Social Security to become more taxable than it otherwise would have been. It still may be worth it, though, right? Having extra income coming in can have a wonderful impact on just the family budget could yeah. be funding some cool stuff that you're doing in a semi-retired kind of a, a lifestyle. Maybe it's funding some travel or, or whatever. But um, just pay attention that you may find yourself um, going from paying almost no taxes to now all of a sudden I need to be uh, paying attention to the, the amount I'm having withheld from my paycheck or maybe I need to be paying some quarterly estimates, that, that kind of thing. I, I think of first tax planning like tax shelters so mm -hmm. going back to work you might now be eligible for a 401k right. and and you can you might think well wait a second i'm going back to work to get some paycheck money get some pocket change why would i defer some of that into the 401k well, I, well, I don't maybe you're getting an employer match mm -hmm. right that might be a reason i've got an individual who is who's who's uh who's driving right yeah. and and retired and then started driving works i don't know two days a week something like that and He's living off of this money, but he's still contributing 6% to the 401k to get the full company match. And that's and so that becomes an, an interesting planning question as well. Do I do that pre-tax and reduce my taxable income? Yeah. Or do I do that post-tax? Yeah. And I've talked to folks that have said, hey, I, you know, I'm going to retire at 65, and then at 66 they're still working. And then you say, well, how's this retirement plan going? And they say, well, I'll probably work till I'm 70, uh, but what should I do about Social Security? And I've seen them turn on the Social Security to do a, a couple of different things. What you've mentioned, Josh, is, all right, well, I'm going to do some extravagant travel or do some things with my family. Or what you said, Mike, I'm going to uh, I'm going to fund my retirement plan, mm -hmm. or fully fund the retirement plan. I had a client who had a, an interesting career. He was an engineer. He worked uh, for John Deere, and he said he loved the company. He didn't like the work. Hmm. He moved and he was a, an engineer at a different company. And he said he loved the work, but didn't Met like the, the company. company. Well, wow. interesting. And he retired because he said, "Listen, I've been around long enough to know that you know by the time you get to be about seventy-five, you just make plans on how to how to die." And so he had this this idea that, "Look, I want to do some living before I get to seventy-five." Hmm. So they, they went and, and kind of built a, a dream home. And then he said, hey, I've got this goal of paying off my mortgage um, because they, the, the, the mortgage they had on their home wasn't, wasn't an issue, didn't impact their retirement at all. But he said, hey, I want to do this. So he started doing consulting work and did consulting work uh, pretty heartily until – um, that mortgage was paid off. Mm -hmm. ah, interesting. That's yeah, cool. Great. You know, one of the other advantages, same same line of thinking here on tax shelters, you have to, in order to fund a Roth IRA, let's say, you have to have earned income. You have to have wages or you have to have a, a self-employed business or, or something like that. And I, I've seen a number of people go back to work here recently and they're earning now enough to fund a Roth IRA for them and for their spouse. And you could use the money that they're actually earning at that time. So get that paycheck money and throw it straight into a Roth. Or in this particular case, they had already accumulated a bunch of money that was not in a tax shelter and it was just sort of idle cash lying around yeah. that as they earn interest on it, they have to pay tax on it. But when you move it to a Roth, now all of a sudden, as it's earning money, it's tax-free. 
And so it was an opportunity for them to just be sheltering a little bit more money out of the hands of the government, out of the hands of creditors, that sort of thing, put it to use growing in a tax-free environment. And then, you know, not only would that allow you to contribute to a Roth or even an IRA if you needed to get your adjusted gross income down below a certain level or something like that. Maybe you're looking and saying, well, now that I've gone back to work, I'm actually bumping into the 22% tax bracket. And when I do that multi-year tax projection, I'll probably only be in the 12% tax bracket once I re-retire. Um, maybe you want to defer some of that and, and, and contribute to an IRA. You could also make enough so that your spouse could could contribute as well. It's not that your spouse would need to go back to work. Technically, the contribution limit into an IRA or Roth IRA is a hundred percent of your earnings, up to seven grand, six grand plus the thousand dollar catch up uh, mm -hmm. per person. So if you make fourteen thousand at least in your part time job, that means you could do a Roth IRA or an IRA, and so could your spouse as mm -hmm. well. So benefits for going back to work. The other things, and Josh, Kevin, you can kind of already mentioned this, going back to work might put you in the next tax bracket. Got to be aware of that. That doesn't mean all of your income then will be taxed at a higher amount, just the amount over that limit. So it's not the boogeyman, but you got to be aware of it. Second is if you're still drawing Social Security, earning, earning more money could mean more of your Social Security is taxable. Now, this is the, this is the scary part where, okay, I'm going to go to work and I'll make an extra 10 grand. And it causes 20 grand to be added to your taxable income. Not the end of the world, not a reason not to work, but something to be aware of. And then finally, does this mean you going back to work, does it mean your, your income is going to be high enough where two years from now you'll actually have to pay more for your Medicare via uh, your um, frenemy, Irma, <laughs> um, where you now have... Uh, to pay a surcharge on, on your Medicare. So all of those are tax planning considerations and others. Maybe you don't do a Roth conversion. This is one of the reasons why if you consider that strategy, you might want to might wait until near the end of the year to do that just in case you go back to work. There's other income, something like that. We can geek out on tax planning opportunities all day long. The point is you need to have a geek on your team, someone <laughs> that is uh, your financial kind of CFO, your CFO, but the, who understands taxes and is aware of the tax planning opportunities. Guys, let's let's also hit how going back to work impacts your investments. Well, boy, if um, if going back to work means you've got more income coming into the household in what you thought were going to be your retired years, what it means is ultimately that you're not putting as much burden on your portfolio. Right. Yep. And in a bear market like we've encountered here in 2022, that can have a huge impact on your retirement success because you're not tapping into resources that are potentially down in value. You can be more patient than many of your peers would be because, you, again, you're, you're not tapping into investments at the, the wrong time, ultimately. Yeah. Yeah. So not only with those tax shelters, could you be adding dollars to your investments just Having extra income means you have to, or, or could, withdraw less from your investments, giving them more time to grow uh, and recover and then grow in the future for, your, uh, for, for the long term. All right. What other ways will your financial life be impacted if you unretire? We've got that and more coming up on The Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Going in the fourth. Yep. So anything that we haven't hit yet, so let's leave it all out on the table. And if there's time, we'll get into questions. Is there anything we haven't hit yet? I don't know. I mean, we kind of touched on budget and what it can do for you there. Uh, it seems like the only of the six areas that we haven't really mentioned is estate planning. And I, I think it could have imp implications there. Okay. Let's hit it. You know, if you're... If you're going back to work, not really because of financial reasons, it's it's really truly extra. Some people start getting even more generous because they've got these earnings. They start giving away money on an annual basis or or whatever. Thanks for being here. This is the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. My name is Mike Bernard. With me in the KFG studios, Kevin Corhorn and Josh Gregory. Uh, every episode of The Wise Money Show is on podcast. Wherever you listen, go search The Wise Money Show and follow us or subscribe to it there. And you can listen to every episode. And also, when you're there, do us a favor and rate the program. We appreciate that. All right. Up until this point, we've been focused on unretiring. And Kevin mentioned there's even a 
There's even a website out there that really, I mean, number one, if this is part of your one of, well, part of your financial plan, whether it's something that you've been planning or just kind of came up, work with your CFP on it. I mean, we get this question all the time. I'm thinking of going back to work. And um, while it's a newer trend, I think because primarily the market's down, life's gotten more expensive, the job market's heating up. I also think, Josh, you mentioned this, that a lot of the COVID retirement was faulty retirement. It mm -hmm. that I was leaving something as opposed to going to something. Um, lots of reasons why there's an uptick in this, but this isn't a new phenomenon. Work with your CFP so you can plan out specifically what opportunities does this create and what other adjustments do you, do you need to wear, be aware of. Your CFP that's doing comprehensive financial planning will help you cover all of these things that we've mentioned and more. But what else, guys? What Before we get into listener questions, what other ways could re-entering the workforce after you've initially retired, how could it impact your financial life? Well, I, I think maybe the most obvious one that we've sort of glossed over a little bit throughout this show is just the, the implications that it has on normal cash flow. You know, your, your monthly budget in retirement, it may have started to feel a little bit too fixed and you are starting to feel the effects of all the inflation that's been running rampant here over the past couple of years. And um, all of a sudden, when you start injecting more income, those wages back into that picture, it can relieve some pressure for a little while. But um, ultimately, it, it may allow you to do some things that you would have otherwise said no to. Mm -hmm. um, maybe out of just caution during a bear market like this, you want to you want to be more conservative in your spending. Well, maybe you don't have to quite as much when you've got these extra earnings. So it is it's pretty frequent that we, we see this a lot where uh, people go back to work even just on a part time basis and they have a specific reason in mind. You know, this is going to be the travel fund or this is going to be the kitchen remodel fund. That's why I'm working right now. Yeah. Uh, Kevin mentioned an example of someone who wanted to wipe out a mortgage that was affordable in, in retirement, but they just wanted it to be gone, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So setting a goal and attaching it to a short-term objective in your financial life is one of the benefits of going back to work, even if it's just part-time. Yep. I'll throw one more out there if we've okay. got a, a moment. And yep. uh, I, I've observed this one as well, where maybe you don't have a specific goal in mind for going back to work. It really is. You're, you're going back to work because you just miss the work or you, you just love it that much. And it's almost like the extra cash flow that's rolling in is not, it's like an afterthought or something. It's It really truly is just extra. And we often see people um, using money like that to get really generous towards uh, some things that they care about. It could be um, a, a charity that you really want to support. It could be your family. Maybe you realize that when, when you look at your retirement uh, forecast, even in light of a bear market, you're going to be fine financially. You and your certified financial planner have, have quantified this and you have confidence that this really is extra. Well, what could you do that's pretty cool that maybe otherwise would have waited until after you're gone? You're leaving the extras behind to a cause or a family member or something like that. What, what if you could enjoy giving that gift during your lifetime? A lot of people start to do that with these extra earnings in their, in their second working career. Yeah. And I would go even beyond the, the, the financial impact. I've seen a lot of folks that <clears throat> excuse me, have benefited just emotionally, physically from re-engaging. They, they said, hey, I'm a little bit too sedentary in my lifestyle. I want to get active. I want to get involved. I remember we had a client and she worked, I'm going to say, till she was 83 in the school corp mm -hmm. and um, was just amazing. I mean, she she could have passed for 63, mm -hmm. but it kept her very young. She loved what she did. She loved the interaction with people, and she was important. What what she did, she made an, an important contribution. It was valued. Yeah, so, great. I mean, that there's there's a lot to be said for that to say, hey, I'm, I have some, some real quality of life uh, in, mm -hmm. in these last years mm -hmm. here. When you cool. make this decision to go back to work, even if it's just part-time and you're just making some pocket change, something like that, um, work with your CFP. They can build that into your long-term, your retirement plan, that five-factor retirement plan we talk about all the time. The third factor is income. 
And even if it's not something that you've been planning on, you know, all these years, but now in retirement, yeah, I want to work a little bit extra and, you know, have your CFP plug that in, see what that does to your overall financial life and see if that can help shape some financial decisions, both opportunities, but other other financial issues you, you need to be aware of. So work with your CFP. And uh, as Josh mentioned to start the program, I mean, thank goodness. appreciate you <laughs> coming back to the workforce and helping out because yeah. there's seriously <laughs> a, 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 a gap, a hole yeah. that needs to be. Yeah, we need some serious help. Yeah. All mm-hmm. right, let's transition over to questions from fans of the show. First one, we got Alex. Uh, this is sort of basic question. I think the, I can see the angle here. How much can I contribute to my Roth 401k? And you might think, well, those have a special limit because it's uh, the the Roth IRA has a limit to it, and that limit is up to 100% of what you make since we're talking about working part-time, whatever, but with a cap of $6,000 per year. If you're age 50 and the year you turn age 50 and older, you can do an extra 1000 so that's seven grand. Um, the Roth 401k, though, it follows the 401k limit. That's right. It, it works exactly the same. It doesn't matter whether you're contributing to the traditional side of the 401k or if your plan gives you a Roth option, or maybe you do some blend of the two. You don't have to be all or nothing on, on this, but it's the same limitation. So it's $20,500 this year. And if you're over age uh, 50, then throw on another 6,500. So um, it, w- this has been a show about retirees coming out of retirement so that age group can go as high as 27 uh, into the 401k. Yeah, and there are a lot of common misconceptions um, about – I'm always fascinated by what people think that don't think about finances and financial planning all day, every day. Hmm. And I, my, the most interesting one to me was I had a client come in in her early 50s and she – I you know, was asking the, her and her husband, okay, so you guys contribute to Roth IRAs? And she said, no, I think we're too old. And I mm. said, nope, you are not too old. That's the good news. So think every year you can contribute to an IRA. So in our vernacular, a traditional IRA is pre-tax. A Roth is after tax. And you can also contribute to a company-sponsored retirement plan. If you're self-employed, you can sponsor your own retirement plan. Mm-hmm. But the, So you have two different sets of limits that you want to be aware of. And mm-hmm. a lot of, for most folks, you got bigger, bigger buckets than you can fill up with cash. And if you have any kind of excess cash, whether you've um, made extra money, you got a nice bonus this year, inherited some money, I would say f- fill those buckets up as much as you can because um, if you're 50 plus, the thought of – and I have a client right now. He's retired, but he's making some money, and he's like, well, what should I do? And I said, well, take some of your non-retirement money and put $27,000 into a Roth 401k. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So get, get you can get twenty seven grand working – uh, totally tax free. Yeah, and and that's the key. You can't be retired and contribute to these retirement plans without some earned income, some wages. Right. So you need to be doing some sort of part time work or, uh, or whatever in retirement in order to make yourself eligible. Mm-hmm. All right. Next question from Vito is taking money from my IRA. Does that count as income towards healthcare.gov? Those those. Um, premium tax credit subsidies. What about rental income? Yeah, it it Mm -hmm. all counts. So so the number, the income number, when uh, you're looking at eligibility for some of the reduced premiums by by getting your health insurance through healthcare.gov, which by the way, um, gosh, we could go, I I don't want to get too deep here, but when the Affordable Care Act was originally established, as long as your income was below 400% of the federal poverty level, then you were eligible potentially to receive, to, to pay a cheaper amount for your health insurance through healthcare.gov. You were eligible for these premium tax credits that reduced what you paid. And when we talk about income being below federal poverty level uh, or 400% of the federal poverty level veto, that's that's all of your income. That's, that's, your, that's before your standard deduction. So it's IRA withdrawals, it's capital gains, it's social security, it's rental income, like you mentioned. Um, now, you can reduce that by some above-the-line deductions, 401k contributions, HSA contributions, that sort of thing. But it's before your standard deduction. It's not your taxable income. It's your modified adjusted gross income. Now, that was how the subsidies worked prior to um, the stimulus packages from 
from um, you know the pandemic. The worst title to a stimulus package ever: <laughs> the American Rescue Plan Act. I I still I just don't know what a plan act is. <laughs> Sounds I redundant. I don't I don't know what that is. But the ARPA American Rescue Plan Act basically took those thresholds and got rid of that cap, that four hundred percent above the federal poverty level. That's no longer a cap, and it was supposed to um, basically then no matter what your income was, you were only deemed to afford a certain percentage of that income that could go towards health insurance. And um, if all your health insurance premiums fit within that percentage, then fine. But if if it didn't, then you're you got a premium tax credit for, you know, so that your premiums would fit within that threshold. Sounds confusing. Trust me, it is. Um, (laughs) And uh, but here's the thing. Those those subsidies that change within the American Rescue Plan Act was set to expire at the end of this year and enter the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022, also known I as... I thought you were going to say that was the worst named uh, act ever. The, the biggest I, lie, maybe. I well, I, yeah, there's... It's... Anyway, I, I won't I won't go further on that. But, um, <laughs> baiting just, you. Just, just, just don't call it IRA, and don't call it an IRA either. <laughs> but yeah, you can't really say it's going to reduce inflation. So uh, who knows what we're supposed to call this thing. But that has extended these unique subsidies from ARPA, extended it through the end of 2025. It's a big idea. Tax planning is now still just as important as ever when you're getting your health insurance through healthcare.gov. And if I can just stay on my soapbox a little bit, well, then who does that apply to? Well, if you lose your job, you're in between jobs. If you're self-employed, absolutely. If you plan to retire early, before Medicare, before 65. I mean, this impacts you. Your tax planning is now more important and will stay more important for the next three years than it otherwise would be. You've got to make sure you're getting the right plan to work with your health insurance advisor and your CFP to pick the right plan through healthcare.gov, but be aware of the tax consequences and the tax planning that needs to accompany that. So work with your CFP on that. All right, guys. That's all the time we have for today. On behalf of Josh Gregory, Kevin Corhorn, all of us at Corhorn Financial Group, have a great weekend. We'll see you next Saturday for the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Securities offered through Silver Oak Securities, member FINRA slash SIPC. Advisory services offered through KFG Wealth Management, LLC. Doing business as Corhorn Financial Group. KFG Wealth Management, LLC and Silver Oak Securities Incorporated companies are unaffiliated.